So, Mark, we've just described the different parts um, of the film, but I haven't gone into okay. detail. So we'd love to hear um, you expanding on the handout that we've given everyone with your different okay. sections. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to talk that directly about the film. Um, I'm just going to talk about, uh, I think, the um, sort of cultures, um, issues that... Um, that a film feeds into and, and responds to, um, and as you see, if you uh, if your people have got the handout, I'm going to do that um, under four headings basically. Uh, the first is communicative capitalist sorcery. The second is touchscreen capture. Um, the third is cyberspace time crisis, and the fourth is digital psychedelia. And one of the interesting things about Nathema then um, is that it's is about communicative capitalism, um, and it's also about the means by which communicative capitalism spreads and propagates. Uh, and, a, and a further level up from that is about um, the the propagation of those means of propagation. In other words, it's about uh, on a on a simple level. Then um, it's about the touchscreen technologies uh, fundamentally, um, which. Uh, are the key platforms for the spreading of community of capitalism. Um, but it is uh, predominantly taken from uh, advertising and for those technologies. <coughs> so first of all, what do we mean by community of capitalism? Um, well, the term uh, originates with Jody Dean's work. Um, sorry, you okay? Okay, um, the term originates uh, with the work of Jody Dean, and, and I think makes a crucial contribution to the critique of the form that power, uh, capitalist power now assumes. Um, and, and also a corrective, um, an important corrective um, to the idea um, that um, the proliferation of, of communication in cyberspace um, has an inherently liberatory dimension. Um, Jody's work shows uh, that uh, the form that capitalism now takes uh, is essentially not, it's essentially about soliciting communication. Um, and just as, in a way, just as capital is indifferent um, to what it sells, so communicative capitalism is really indifferent to what is being said. Um, it, it doesn't matter what is being said. What matters is the sheer volume of, of, um, volume of communication itself. Um, and this comes out in a quote from Jody and, and, and the handout that I've given you. <clears throat> Today, the circulation of content in the dense, intensive networks of global com communication relieves top level actors, corporate, institutional and governmental from the obligation to respond. Rather than responding to messages sent by activists and critics, they counter with their own contributions to the circulating flow of communications, hoping that sufficient volume whether in terms of number of contributions or the spectacular nature of contribution, will give their contributions dominance or stickiness. Instead of engaged debates, instead of contestations employing common terms, points of references, or demarcated frontiers, we confront uh, a multiplication of resistances and assertions so extensive that it hinders the formation of strong counter hegemonies. The proliferation, distribution, acceleration, and intensification of communicative access and opportunity, far from enhancing communicative governance, sorry, from enhancing democratic governance or resistance, results in precisely the opposite, the post-political formation of communicative capitalism. Okay, so I think what's important about this uh, is that um, whilst uh, on one level it seems as if um, this is and this is sold to us as if we're in a new world of uh, horizontal communication, um, where um, powers that be are held to account, in, and, and and also where we have much more um, power and control and capacity to participate than we once had. Um, but I think, um, as Jody brings out in her work, really, this is really a form of not not only is this a form of pseudo participation, it's a form which is. Uh, in many ways, inherently defeated um, by the very form that it, by the very form that it assumes. Um, 
by by this very com commodifiability um well but the fact that this form is in fact the the the, the most important form um of late capitalist commodity and actually uh, i think jody's work is, is really anticipated um quite strikingly um by the work of um jean baudrillard um baudrillard's work uh from the end of the 60s um on into the uh, on into the 70s now reads as a uh, almost shockingly prophetic way um the third quote on the sheet um that i gave you um from um for critique of the political economy of the sign um from the early 70s today consumption if this term has a meaning other than that given to it by vulgar economics defines precisely the stage where the commodity is immediately produced as a sign, as sign value, and where signs culture are produced as commodities. Um, you know, this is clearly uh, anticipating or already seeing the tendency um, for the move into what we call um, sort of immaterial labor, for the move into uh, commodities that are essentially uh, that's immaterial, that, are essentially, that, that acquire their value um, well, their value is, as, as Baudrillard says, inextricable from um, sign value. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But this leads on to the really second, um, a second uh, heading I want to talk under, which is a, a, a touchscreen capture. Um, okay, so we lost the lots of ways we live inside the, the world that Baudrillard predicted. And one, one of the astonishing thing uh, about Baudrillard's work is. Um, how it has moved from being sort of utterly dismissed, um, uh, you know, particularly by um, by the left, I would have to say, you know, why are we talking about um, signs, etc.? Why why aren't we talking about proper economics? Um, to, it's been uh, dismissed uh, and disdained in that way. It's now, practically everything he said being taken utterly for granted, and that, that you know we have an economy based um, not on um, material qualities of things, but on the, um, on their um, and their sign value. Um, but Baudrillard, uh, I mean, one of the striking things then about uh, another the striking resonances of Baudrillard's work, um, not only with today, but specifically with Anathema, uh, is the question of tactility and, and Baudrillard's understanding of the, the way in which power would function uh, in a tactile mode. Um, a few quotes here. Um, which I've given, which we've given you, which uh, which illustrate this. Um, I'm going to go to the, the second one um, in the second section. Um, I think some summarizes clearly um, what Baudrillard thought was happening. Um, solicitation is substitute for the ultimatum. Mandatory pass passivity evolves into models constructed directly from the active responses of the subject. His or her implication, ludic participation. And finally, towards a total environmental model made up of incessant spontaneous responses, joyful feedback, and irradiated contact. Bear in mind, this is written in 1977, uh, but I think it describes our own social field um, and the communicative, uh, the field of communicative capitalism, uh, much more accurately and much more powerfully than described the world of his own day in many ways. This is the great festival of participation composed of myriad stimuli, miniaturized tests, infinitely divisible nodes of query and reply, magnetized by a few overarching models illuminated by the code. The culture of tactile communication is in fact burgeoning the techno luminokinetic kinetic space provided by this total spatio-dynamic theater. It brings with it a kind of contact imaginary, a sensorial mimeticism, a tactile mysticism, that graphs onto the universe of operational simulation and multi-stimulation and multi-response like an entire system of ecological concepts. Okay, now, what's at stake in this concept of the tactile for Baudrillard? Well, partly it's um, a move for him beyond, or plainly beyond the visual, um, and, and partly uh, the, the influence uh, here, um, and one of the thinkers that he, uh, repeatedly engages within his work in the um, 70s is McLuhan. Um, and 
what he's what he's playing on and developing is really opposition between um, hot and cool media, um, as proposed by McLuhan. Uh, in many ways, as we enter the the, the era of cool media, and hot media are those which simply um, blast things at you, uh, which simply uh, require what he calls mandatory um, passivity in, in the quotation I just read. Um, but um, Baudrillard, in common with McLuhan, really thinks that that that, um, that period of um, sorry, some building work going on next door, which is <coughs> um, proving a little bit distracting. Okay, so Baudrillard, Baudrillard really thinks of that period of so, um, of communication, um, uh, of that form of communication, um, where people are just passive spectators uh, is over. Um, we're no longer in the era of the spectacles, Baudrillard says in a number of his writings. We're in the era of participation, um, where we, we will be solicited, um, where our, 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 our participation will, will, will be constantly solicited. Um, again, we have to remind ourselves that Baudrillard was writing at the time of, um, you know, still mass media and television, um, where, where these forms were really only in their infancy. I mean, Baudrillard was one of the first, um, Baudrillard was very quickly onto the implications of reality TV, which he wrote about uh, in, in the late 70s. And he also wrote about in Symbolic Exchange and Death, which is from uh, the source uh, of that last quotation. He also wrote about um, uh, the what he called the, the referendum mode, um, the tendency for politics, um, uh, well, the question about to what degree um, of influence do things like opinion polls um, have on the actual results of elections? For Baudrillard, we simply can't answer that anymore because the opinion poll is already itself in a feedback loop with the thing that it is uh, ostensibly representing. Um, and this fusion, really, of reality TV, which poses the same question, what, how much effect does the camera have on um, those it is ostensibly recording? Again, for Baudrillard, we simply can't know because as soon as the camera enters into the um, um, enters into the field that it's recording, then um, you know this question of it of its influence, the question of the extent to which it is itself engaged in a process of cybernetic feedback um, with what it is ostensibly kind of passively recording, um, is an open one, which we which is unanswerable for Baudrillard. Um, What's striking about a lot of the, the, the developments of sort of entertainment culture in the 21st century then is the way in which they fuse these two modes that we have um, uh, that the uh, reality TV mode um, synthesized with the kind of um, opinion poll mode um, in, you know, in, in sort of the talent competition, that, which um, is classically Baudrillardian, that we, we could not have things like um, X Factor, Britain's Got Talent, etc., cetera, um, without the audience. The audience is not there simply to observe it. It's not an audience um, in, in the old sense. The audience is there um, as part of the, the, the feedback loop. Um, and, you know, I, I think Baudrillard very quickly under, understood the ways in which this, in a way, urge for the urge for democratic participation would be captured um, by capital and, um, and sold back to us. Um, where, you know, power in a way absents itself um, and contracts itself out to us. Um, and as it were, as it were, why is why is mainstream culture rubbish? It's our fault. Uh, you know, it's our fault if we didn't watch it, um, if we didn't participate in it, if we didn't text or, or phone in on with to Big Brother or um, uh, or the X Factor, then these shows couldn't function. And that they, that is that is plainly true. Um, that. You know, uh, they they require our participation. Um, our particip participation isn't some um, optional extra. It's, it's completely fundamental to it. And so, what's the stake then? In partly in the concept of the tactile for Baudrillard, um, which was uh, in some ways then, uh, um, in his time, being used as as a metaphor. And the tactile is the nature uh, is the notion of a two way. You touch something. And when you know when you when you look at something, um, you remain distant from it. You know your eye is uh, uh, apart from the, uh, the you know the the object or the surface um, 
at which its gaze is directed. This is impossible with touch. You know, when you touch something, it touches you back. Um, and you know, this this he this he saw, as he says, with this tactile imaginary, um, would be the form that power, though he wouldn't himself like, doesn't even like the term power because he thinks um, that is compromised by these new set of tactile relations. Um, tactility then, uh, the, the, the tactile imaginary, as he puts it, um, becomes uh, the, 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 the principal form um, in w which, well, I'll call it power, will assume um, under um, what others, but not really him, were called sort of late capitalism. Um, now, of course, the, the, one of the key developments since Baudrillard's day is the, is the literalization of tactility now. Uh, and this is one of the interesting things about anathema then, is that it's, um, it's dealing with this uh, a tactility which is not a um, figurative one. Um, or, well, perhaps it's more figurative than it appears, actually. Um, but where the, uh, well, there's an apparent move but beyond, beyond the metaphorical into an, a kind of actual tactility, um, the tactility of our, you know, of, our, of, of our fingers touching screens. Um, the capacity to directly, um, the capacity to, to directly affect what we're seeing on a screen um, with our fingers. Um, but I, I say that this is a more, um, a, rather a less metaphorical form of, of tactility. Um, but in many ways, it, it isn't. Um, and here's where I think it's worth bringing in um, the work of Friedrich Kittler. Um, and Kittler, who um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with his work, but I mean, one of one strand of it is a is a critique of um, the graphic user interface. Um, you know, uh, particularly sort of uh, developed by Apple, then sort of stolen by Windows. Um, the graphic user interfa interface, which makes things sort of more user friendly. Um, but also, uh, crucially for Kittler, um, locks people out of the computer. Um, so um, in the early days when the user, the user of computers was also a programmer, it's then you could really interact with uh, the machinery, as it were. Um, now for Kittler, uh, the, the more that graphic user interface develops, um, the less, the less um, access we have to the kind of machine logics um, of computers themselves, and the more we, the more we uh, are interacting with things which reflect back the world to us um, that we're already familiar with. And um, hence this quote uh, that I gave you on the handout: through the use of keyboards um, like user uh, interface, user friendliness, or even data protection, the industry has damned humanity to remain human. Um, and I think there's a a broader sort of um, a broader issue raised by this here, and by um, by the limitations of the kind of tactile imaginary, by the, the pseudo participation and the kind of frenzy of um, communicative activity, um, which we're we're all involved in, or almost all of us involved in to to, um, to some extent now. Um, particularly through um, social media. I think that, um, I think if you see, look at the key developments of, of 21st century kind of entertainment culture, whether that be reality TV um, uh, or social media, uh, the dominant tendency in those, in those media is, to, is, is for them to act as kind of mirrors. Um, and we can see in a way um, a depressing tendency where um, arts, art and culture's capacity to sort of take us out of ourselves um, has been replaced by a function of trapping us in ourselves, of, of um, uh, reflecting back, uh, of reflecting back ourselves, uh, often in our, our most neurotic uh, and narcissistic ways. Um, and this would lead me on to the next point, really, which is about um, the ideology, the kind of tactile ideology, which I, I think emerges in, in 
which as we can see from anathema is more than a question of, of ideas in in um in our minds um it is it's also a kind of erotics um you know the tactile imaginary is one where the screen is broken um where the where where, where our fingers reach out and we and we and we enter into this kind of world of liquid interactions. Um, this is very far from the world of actually dealing with um, actual touch screen technology. Um, <coughs> I don't know about you, but I I, I just hate um, touch screen keyboards myself. Um, and I've, I've, one of the interesting things about Anathema, I think, is that move from um, old style keyboards to, um, to um, touch screen keyboards um, and the the differences between them. I've, got, I've both got a BlackBerry and an iPad, um, and I, I hate I, I, I hate using the iPad to keyboard. Um, maybe we can talk about this afterwards. But I also find that the um, touch screen, rather than this smooth world of pure interaction um, that is um, that is offered, is kind of clunky and blurry. Um, you know, often you know it, 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 you have to. You have to touch in precisely the right place, ex um, exert precisely the right pressure, and actually, the world where you're you're engaging on the plane of abstraction um, via via the um, via the old keyboard, um, rather than apparently engaging directly um, with your fingers, um, is is crisper and, and and sort of clearer than this kind of blurry mess, um, because the problem is, as it were. Uh, at the the part of the, the issue here is the discrepancy between um, between us and the machine. The machine uh, operates um, using, you know, it, it needs it needs very clear commands, whereas our fingers uh, aren't that precise. Um, so uh, from its point of view, it uh, must be extremely irritating to have to deal with these kind of uh, clumsy monkeys um, pouring it uh, in a certain way. But um, and this this leads on to this, I, I think, important critique of um, connection, of the concept of connection um, from um, in the work of uh, Franco Berardi, Bifo, um, where he makes this distinction between connection and um, conjunction. In, he um, Bifo argues that we're in a world dominated by connection, um, not of conjunction. Um, what is the difference? Well, the difference is that connection um, forces the things which are to be connected um, to fit, to be formed. Well, if it requires that the things that are to be connected are formatted in its terms. Um, whereas conjunction allows um, actual difference. Conjunction allows things which are um, heterogeneous to be um, uh, in communication with one another. Um, Connection doesn't allow this. So the next quote then, connection, um, Bifo says, means a relationship between formatted segments, making desingularized bodies compatible. Conjunction means singular, unrepeatable communication between round bodies. Connection means integration of smooth bodies in a space which is no space and in a time which is no time. Okay, well that leads me on to, the, I think, one of the, the key issues um, which anathema engages with, and, and I think directly, I mean, one of the uh, most important aspects of anathema for me is it isn't just engaging in critique, it's engaging in, as the autolithic group themselves say, um, a counterspell. Um, it, is, it, it is itself um, operating with a, uh, a different sense of space time than that of communicative capitalism. Okay, so I just want to spend a few minutes talking about what that uh, dominant uh, experience of space-time is. Um, I think we live in um, we live in times where attention is is besieged, um, where it is very difficult for us to concentrate on any one thing at any time, any one time. Um, where you know, as soon as we're in, as soon as we have smartphones. Um, then we're inside cyberspace at all times and in any place where the signal can reach us. Um, the 
sort of ideology, or, or rather, let's you know, let's put it, put it differently in the terms I just um, outlined above the the um, erotics um, of um, community of capitalism are then of this um, of, of this smooth liquid interaction. Um, but that is not that that might be how things are for capital. Um, but that's not how things are for us, as it were. Um, you know, communi uh, things may move smoothly uh, as messages, um, but in, ter in terms of our um, phenomenology, in terms of our experience of the world, um, it, it is the opposite. And I think this sort of relates to um, Bifo's point about the, di the distinction between connection and um, conjunction. Um, we ourselves then are um, constantly bombarded by um, competing stimuli. Um, you know, uh, if we if you've got a smartphone, the smartphone itself, um, uh, there's multiple possibilities. There's multiple flat platforms um, that can be open at the same time. Um, if we've got a smartphone, we're sitting in front of a computer. Um, then uh, the the uh, possibility for attentional dispersal. Um, is it is clearly even greater um, so I, one way of thinking about this is in terms of speed and slowness i i e that um what what we lack now is 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 a certain kind of um slowness um, and that the problem is that things are too fast well actually um i don't i don't think that really captures um, it's more about um, uh, attentional consistency, really, um, versus bittiness and fragmentation. Um, what the um, experience of um, constantly being um, distracted, uh, of constantly being a sort of um, awoken um, from any kind of um, uh, figurative or actual sort of um, dream state that we're in, the, you know, the effect, the effect of that is this sense of constantly living uh, in a world where uh, everything is interrupted, um, but nothing is ever finished. Um, I was at an event the other day with the music critic Simon Reynolds, who was um, joking about these um, very small scenes on, online. Um, they talk about uh, no audience underground. I think in many ways that we're in a case of a, also a, a no audience overground. Um, uh, a terrifyingly dystopian um, proposition um, that we're actually living in, um, but which, uh, partly because we're living in it, we can't see it. Uh, a world where uh, no one pays attention to anything ever, um, or where um, conditions where we're, we're, we're paying attention um, are extremely rare. And a full paradox here uh, uh, is that, um, you know, if communicative, if, if sign value communicative, what is sign value? As it? Sign value is the value something acquires from uh, being seen to be seen, or or being seen to be attended to. Um, you know, nothing has value sitting on someone's computer. Um, things acquire value via the via the fact that they've been seen to be seen via retweets, likes, um, etc. So the, the full paradox then is that in a time where um, res lots of resources um, which were once scarce, like the, the capacity to sort of make culture, you know, the capacity, to, the capacity to what Brian Wilson had from from the Beach Boys, you know, to uh, is uh, you know to make one of the sort of classic albums of all time. That kind of equipment is now available to to, to practically anyone on. Um, on, on their um, on their PC at home, um, the capacity to distribute worldwide um, is in theory available to everybody. Um, but what is missing, though, uh, what is scarce now, is the attention that would make any of those productions matter at all. That's that that is the real that is the real scarcity. Um, okay, so I think then this opens up. The question of um, what, what is the alternative to this? Um, what is the alternative to this um, condition of permanent lateness, anxiety, harassness, busyness, um, 
where we never have time for anything, um, where um, we never um, we never can um, focus our attention on anything, um, where the alerts on our phones are constantly operating are operating as alarms, um, waking us and inhibiting any kind of um, trans state that we might have fallen into. Um, well, I think that's the most exciting things about anathema is that it's um, is that it is directly contributing to um, a new model of, of of time. And one of the other exciting things about it is that it does this from the through the materials of um, community of capitalism itself. Um, and in a way, that it's a, a fairly simple process that it, that, um, that anathema undertakes, which is um, De anchorage, um, but um, famous theory of anchorage, um, which was you know this was how, uh, you know, I mean, he's talking about advertising fundamentally. This is how um, advertisers um, fix the meaning of images. Um, you know, is by simply you know uh, the, the obvious um, method of uh, labeling and text. Um, so uh, text, voiceover, etc. Fixes the inherently polyvalent meaning um, of meanings and um, of, of, of images rather, um, in order to um, you know sell things. And um, so what uh, anathema does is de-anchor. And um, so it takes the um, it takes uh, advertisements and de-anchors them from um, their um, capturing in by by capital. I think here it's worth mentioning um, the theory of, 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 of capitalism, most famously articulated by um, uh, Michael Hart and Antonio Negri, but which really goes back um, to uh, the Italian autonomous tradition, um, starting with Mario Tronti. Um, really, the, the idea that um, capital is a parasite, fundamentally, that um, um, capital likes to present itself as um, the as, as fundamentally necessary uh, as uh, uh, that with that without which no social relations no productivity um, could possibly happen in the modern world um, but uh, the the autonomist thesis is that capital is essentially and increasingly a parasite um, which um, struggles um, to uh, convert um, sort of sociability, um, communicative interaction of people into profit. Um, and I think what we've got with what, what we get with anathema um, is with, with this de-anchorage of this, of this kind of erotic image flow. Of this, uh, of this promise of um, tactile interaction, um, what we get is the liberation of um, that kind of um, desiring ocean um, of, of of images, um, liberated from capital itself, and we get a we we get a vision. Um, of every and the important thing is well what is what is capital in many ways so capital you know, is a form of capture this comes back to really the um the first quote from um Pignar and Stengers from their book capitalist source which i know is influential on um the production of anathema um a system of sorcery without sorcerers um uh, is what uh, Pignar and um, Stangus call capitalism. But he also um, described capital, you know, uh, what is this sorcery? It is a form of capture. And what is being captured? What is it is desire. And actually, the, you know, the problem that the, the left has had since the 60s, really, is that the right has been able to um, claim desire for its own. Um, you know, and one of the, way, the key ways in which it did that was via communicative capitalism. Um, that, you know, I'm sure people remember the, um, 
the famous Apple advert from 1984, which played on Orwell and which showed, um, uh, you know, new Apple computers as being personally liberated from the totalitarian world of sort of centralized bureaucracy, etc. cetera, um, you know, which was a code for IBM, um, but which also had, a, which can also be read on a more um, straightforward level. Um, but, you know, this is one example of the way in which um, capital successfully presented itself uh, as liberatory and liberatory of of desire. Um, you know, uh, this this is this has been the key story of what I've, one of the key dimensions of what I call capitalist realism. Um, why is capitalism the only sort of um, held to be the only viable political system? Well, because uh, it's the only one which engages with um, people's um, people, the plasticity of people's desires. So it is claimed. Um, desire is a kind of serpent um, that will uh, destroy any other system. Capitalism, rather than trying to repress desire, then um, mobilizes it, um, <coughs> metabolizes it, makes it part of its, um, you know, um, makes it part of fundamentally part of um, its system in a way that allegedly other systems can't. Um, but I, you know, I think that uh, it's very important to, to sort of overcome this um, and to to have a um, uh, anti-capitalism or I prefer a, a vision of post-capitalism, you know, which is which is about which is about desire, and which um, is also about saying that um, capitalism it like, precisely it captures our desires. Um, it doesn't express them. Um, it captures them, and it also um, projects desires which it can't possibly meet. Um, you know, the, the as I say, the smooth, liquid um, world of tactility uh, presented in, in the adverts that um, are sort of sampled mo and montaged in an in anathema. This is very far from the actual world in which we live. You know, um, where uh, very far from the harassed, um, harassed and um, permanently anxious um, state uh, in which m most of, in which, as I uh, argued earlier, we find ourselves most of the time. Um, but what? So what we get anathema then is with this de-anchorage of um, of this um, desiring ocean, which um, capital feeds upon, um, and which. Um, uh, it captures uh, is this vision of another kind of um, another kind of experience of time, um, and uh, and what's also important about this, um, I think, is uh, that the the uh, the anathema film uh, is just as modern, just as technological as as capital itself. Um, because one of the um, sort of fatal oppositions that I think um, anti-capitalism has fallen into uh, is really um, being allowed to uh, be, allowing itself to be seen as anti-technological and as anti-modern. Um, so that it confirms the notion that the only possible modernity in, is that of capitalism. Um, and, what, and the only possible modernity then would be this world of um, permanent busyness. Um, per, and you know what I've also called business ontology, where uh, ultimately it's it's business which determines um, w what is most important um, in life, um, culture, and art. Um, so this uh, th that is why I'm, I'm talking about a sort of digital psychedelia. Then that within the the, um, uh, the sort of uh, technological means. Um, uh, that are, that are currently used by communicative capitalism um, can be used for different purposes, um, which are um, immersive, um, which are which allow this time of a kind of uh, simultaneous attentional focus and drift, um, both of which are kind of blocked out by um, communicative capitalism. And as I say, uh, I think the power of anathema. Uh, is that it doesn't really talk about this, it actually does it for us. Um, and I, th I think I'll leave it there for now.
So I'm sure you've suffered enough with it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, inevitable Skype glitches and connection problems uh, which <laughs> fully, fully illustrate Berardi's point, I think, actually. I think maybe people have some questions if you've got some time. Got time? Yeah. Yep, cool. Um, I just have one I prepared earlier. Um, okay. I'm really interested in the aspect of Nathema that's kind of about um, language and this kind of um, loss of language and then a kind of regaining of language taking control and also the kind yeah. of um, the mute aesthetics of the whole thing yeah. that these um, advertisements are kind of rendered mute and it becomes a kind of seductive yeah it becomes sedu seductive aesthetics that kind of they bring out the, the kind of dark element I suppose of that um, there's definitely an eerie edge to it um, yeah. and in your book Capitalist Realism you kind of speak a bit about um, teenagers that are drawn into, that spend all their time online, that are always hooked up to the Matrix, and that they yeah. have a kind of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, a pathology of late capitalism, which is a term we actually used in our catalogue, pathologies okay. of the present. So that was kind of interesting to reread and come across that. Um, and you um, kind of describes the term, uh, you use the term postlexia to describe these kids. Um, yeah. And they spend all their time with this um, capital's image dense data, which I suppose is exactly what anathema looks at. Um, yeah, yeah. And you quoted um, Deleuze and Guattari um, that capitalism is profoundly illiterate. Yes. Um, and I also mentioning um, before um, in After the Future, he kind of talks about how people are desensitized by this streamlined semi circulation and they kind of. I, I can't remember if I made this up or if you read it, but anyway, the, the kind of um, <laughs> lo I, I wrote about it a while ago about um, the kind of loss of language when you're that desensitized, you can't articulate so well. I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. I don't have a question there; it's kind of chat still in there. No, no, okay, that's fine. I mean, I, I think yeah, I forgot, I forgot about those. That's our chain of stuff actually, which is is I think highly relevant to um, to anathema. Well, I think I'm you know somewhat ambivalent about that post lexical thing in, in capitalist realism. Um, in that, uh, it was just, it's, it's not simply that something that's just bad, as it were, that they, they are, that, that, that uh, the young are, are post-lexical. I mean, what, what to me was, um, was bad about that um, was that they were, they, they were caught between two things, that they're still sort of in, in a world where they're judged by, and judged by standards of lexicality or lexical performance and still required to do that um, when, when effectively um, they're operating outside that world and you know this is this producing them, this, this crisis of uh, one of the factors that's producing a crisis of institutions you know, what the institutions are operating with um, outmoded disciplinary lexical um, uh, um, criteria um, when you know uh, the students themselves are, are um, much more directly plugged into um, the way that late capitalism itself operates, but that is itself ambivalent. Um, in that you know being directly plugged into something um, may it may mean yes you're very effective at, at, at functioning in it, but you, but but also you don't you can't really see it. The more that we rely on something, the 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 more it fades into the background, the less we can see it in a way, and that's a kind of um, it's kind of basic to the um, the theories of McLuhan. I think the, the, the ways in which the, the technologies in which we most depend are those which we, we, we have the least understanding of. As he puts it, you know, a fish can't see water. And um, but it's actually McLuhan um, in that passage from Anti Oedipus, um, where um, Deleuze and Guattari just talk about capitalism as um, illiterate. They, they they also talk about McLuhan. Um, and yes, so that, that I think they, they're anticipating that this move into um, exactly this kind of, I mean, libidinal engineering is another phrase I would use. What, you know, what is PR and advertising? It's not, it's not simply, it's not, it's not about, simply about message that has been communicated. Um, you know, it, it is about uh, the engineering um, of desire itself. Um, well, uh, <coughs> uh, but it's clear that I mean, there's, there's still some minimal role for text in that. Um, there has to be some minimal anchorage. 
and in, in a way, this is what we can see. What is the comparison system of capitalism now? We could say is in that minimal anchorage, um, and as it were, all of this stuff is circulating, um, <coughs> proliferating, etc. Um, the capital has sort of has to has to re-anchor it. Um, how does it how does it re-anchor it? Does it by um, well, it, it's partly sigilistic. Uh, but what I mean that, but by that is but the sigils, brand, um, in, um, you know, uh, brand logos, um, but also by some, um, but, but, but also you know, text still plays a role in, um, in, in that kind of anchorage, um, and then it's an, an, um, an open question I think about how we how do we escape this? Um, do we escape um, from language itself? Uh, is it language that's the problem since, since capital? Despite being illiterate, still needs um, some minimal form of language, um, or, is it, or, is the, or is there an escape um, from uh, outside uh, outside language in a certain way? Um, and like like you say, I think a lot of mathematics then is um, wordless, um, and the words that, the words that do appear are uh, glossolalia, uh, nonsense. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not sure that I've got, uh, just as you haven't got a, uh, a question, I'm not sure I've got an right answer, but I hope no, that's some response. It's anyway. an interesting response. <laughs> <laughs> um, I might just think, does anyone have any questions that they want to ask? I'm just a little bit curious, Mark. Sorry, just um, picking up on that last point. Where can I stand? Can we go around there? Um, hi. <laughs> um, just picking up on that last point. Um, I um, I actually did transcribe the um, the, the Fred Moten counterspell today because I wanted to read it okay. <laughs> as opposed to listen to it. Um, okay. And again, that's kind of really curious because um, I mean they said, and it's true, it's very hard to follow. That's the the last little spoken word bit at the, the end. Um, it's very tricky to follow, but then if you actually transcribe it and read it. Um, it makes this kind of, uh, you know, almost sort of expansive sense, and it seems to suggest that it's these kind of contradictory forces of play, like this sort of negation of, um, a, you know, negation of uh, what are uh, behavioural norms or uh, societal kind of conditions, um, without realizing it themselves that bring forth a new language um, that in itself is the counterspell like it's a I don't know if I'm explaining myself clearly but it seems to not be um, yeah it, it doesn't seem to be anti it seems to be that it's 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 in the contradiction itself um, that that some kind of uh, notion of escape or or um, maybe even expansion, you know, some, some, as a different sort of movement out of enclosure actually occurs. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, was, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not fully sure how the, um, how I think the Moton uh, uh, sort of piece at the end fits in with the rest of the film. Um, obviously, it carries. It carries. It, it can be seen as carrying a lot of weight because it's the only um, piece of non nonsensical sort of language in the actual film itself. So it can be read as the key to the whole film, I suppose. Yeah, but uh, at the same time, it's. I mean, it's so difficult to follow unless you okay. well, unless you read it. I think. It's, it's, it's yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, I haven't got a, I haven't got a very strong response to, to that. I think. I, I mean, um, to be honest, um, that, I mean, mainly because I, I tell you why. Mainly because um, you know, I, I just was interested in uh, I was fundamentally sort of was more than interested, kind of um, seduced and entranced um, by the the de-anchored um, um, non-linguistic. Uh, quality of, of of the rest of the film actually um, that 
I almost didn't want it to be um, re-anchored in anything at, at, at the end, if if that was what, um, if that was what the Moton was was supposed to be doing. And I don't, I don't think it was supposed to be doing that. But um, uh, yeah, so that's that's why I guess I've um, I sort of leave that out of my response to the film in a certain way, which maybe <laughs> <not. laughs> maybe that maybe just that I've um, I've not properly processed that yet. Uh, that, that, that dimension of it. We've just got because some, I'm, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm so, so seduced by the early part of the film, um, but I don't want to hear words again at that point. <laughs> um, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I was just yelling out, but I wasn't sure if it was going to work. I was just wondering, maybe that that last text functions in a similar way to how um, to how you're analysing the film as a whole, in that like it's it's sort of it is de-anchoring because you can't actually follow it really. Like you have these sort of key things come out of it that you can attach to something, oh. but they're actually not, um, it's not coherent as as a whole. So maybe it's as a text functioning a similar way as how you spoke about the images being taken, kind of using the seduction with seduction, that kind of, um, mm, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Well, I mean, I've only seen it once, so maybe it's a... Seduction is another Baudrillard term, of course. Uh, you know, I think um, uh, you know that 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 uh, it's time to uh, as as you've probably picked from picked up from today, it's time to definitely uh, reassess Baudrillard and look back at him. I think, um, uh, you know, I mean, for someone who's writing this 30, 40 years ago, it has an astonishing grip. I think on on um, the the quality of the, and uh, phenomenology of, of of life today. Yes, and we keep in mind that you didn't make the film, so you can't tell us every little detail about it too. No, 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 exactly. I, I only, I mean, um, yeah, it's, um, I, I didn't, I, um, I didn't make it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you've given a really amazing analysis of it, um, and I think maybe we're done. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. That's been really oh, great. Thank you. Well, thank everybody who's there. I can sort of see in a blurry way, but um, that's. <laughs> No, you're fine. <coughs>